Good evening. I'm Patsy Hicks, Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the museum to welcome you to our conversation via Zoom with Kim Beal, author of Good Pictures. During the last 15 minutes or so of this hour we'll spend together, Kim will take questions from you, the audience. So to simplify things, we ask that you please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we thank those of you who sent in photographs that we will be using a little bit later this evening. And now something about the author. Kim Beale is an accomplished art historian, teacher, critic, and author whose book, Good Pictures, brings her back virtually to Santa Barbara this evening. And yes, she has a history here and with this museum. I first met Kim when she walked in the door of the museum, a recent graduate of Brown University, then studying at Brooks Institute of Photography and eager to volunteer. Our beloved, savvy and simpatico then curator of photography, Karen Sinsheimer, opened the door for Kim to get involved and soon hired her as her curatorial assistant. Kim went on to earn her doctorate at the University of California, Irvine, and now teaches art history at Stanford University and writes for modern and contemporary art publications, including Art Forum, Art in America, Bomb, and Photograph. It is revealing and perhaps relevant to tonight's discussion that she thinks of Instagram as research. Her book has been lauded as being both encyclopedic and engaging, illustrating the ever-shifting trends in photography that reflect new ways of thinking about ourselves and our place in the visual world. Bright, witty, knowledgeable, with a serious sense of play, Kim will share with us tonight photographic trends and train her eye on selected photos submitted by the audience as well as answer your questions. So now, here to explore the deceptively simple question of what makes good pictures, please join me in welcoming our esteemed colleague and longtime friend, Kim Beale. Thank Welcome, you so Kim. much. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, for bringing me into the museum the very first time when I showed up at the back door. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and walk you through a little bit of this history of good pictures. So it's a great pleasure to be among Santa Barbara Museum of Art folks again, uh, even though we're physically distant. In some ways, that's really what photography has always allowed us to share a vision and sometimes an experience across great distances, across geographic space, but also across time and through history. So today we're gonna to look at how trends in photography change over time. Although how-to books typically describe the rules of photography as static or universal, in fact, what we define as the good picture is constantly changing. The best backgrounds or lighting effects or even poses change rapidly. What was popular in the 1980s looks outdated today, and we might even call some of those bad pictures. One of the best ways to see these changes is through the study of how-to manuals. Looking through decades of these guidebooks for my book, I saw that styles regularly cross over from the do's to the don'ts column. So as Patsy mentioned, this research is drawn from my new book, Good Pictures. The book tracks 50 trends in photography since the 1840s. Tonight, I'm gonna to walk you through just a few of them, including several that showed up in the pictures that you sent in to the museum. And I should just give you a little plug here. If you want um, a discount, you can purchase the book through Stanford University Press before the 30th and you get 40% off. Okay, regularly scheduled. So I'll start with two trends that are widely seen today and especially popular on social media, the high angle photo for selfies and golden hour lighting for portraits. Social media has made pictures more visible and smartphones have certainly increased the number of pictures we take, but trends in photography were nearly as short lived in the 19th and 20th century as they are today. 
1912, Kodak began publishing a how-to series called How to Make Good Pictures. The series ran through the 1990s. Not only did the books offer technical suggestions, but they also established many of the occasions for photographing that are still prevalent today. They recommended critical moments of family life from weddings and babies firsts to vacations and holidays and casual pictures around the home. Lots of these occasions showed up in the pictures that you sent to me and these are just a selection of them. Kodak's guide even recommended how to make an album and provided sample pictures as in this chapter from a 1930s guidebook called a picture biography of a boy. The biography shows many of the same occasions that we still make pictures in. The first family snapshot, the first birthday, as they say, every birthday, a picture occasion. And of course, this is when you start to realize that the Kodak how-to manuals are also selling film. The more pictures you take, the more film you buy. So usually around this time of year, we see a lot of these pictures, the off to school shots. But some of those trends change from photographs at the front door to, of course, pictures at the kitchen table for Zoom first day of schools. Uh, these are examples of content trends uh, or what to take pictures of. But I'm going to concentrate this evening on style or the aesthetic effects of pictures. What do they look like? What camera angles, lighting or colors were preferred? So I'm going to start with one of the first named trends in photographic history, and that is the Rembrandt effect. It was invented in 1868 by the New York Society photographer William Kurtz, and he used reflectors to create a sense of depth in head and shoulders portraits by introducing shadows. And these recalled uh, the dark paintings of the Dutch old master Rembrandt. In 1869, just a year after the trend became popular, the editor of a photo industry publication that these pictures were quite the rage. So since early photographic processes demanded such a large amount of light, most studios were located on a building's top floor and lit by skylights. Early guides suggested limiting the number of sources to just one large window. And those skylights were preferred above all else, even though overhead lighting cast dark shadows on the subject's face, especially under the brow and the nose. So these shadows were considered limitations in early portrait photography, and photographers worked really hard to eliminate them. And you can see the result of that in these daguerreotype portraits. The faces are completely evenly lit without a shadow on either side, one critic wrote of Rembrandt effect portraits that, quote, doubtless the most important gain realized by this new style photograph will be to crush out all the old prejudices against shadows. Every provincial operator has wept over the unappreciative rustics who insist on taking, having their faces taken like the full moon, square to the front and in complete light, whilst others refuse a three quarter head because it is too black on one side. So of course, I hear racialized language in this quote, quote, as well as classist language, deriding those rustics for trying to emulate the styles of the metropolitan elite. It's kind of like carrying a knockoff uh, Louis Vuitton. People in the know deride fakes for their lesser quality. By 1870, critics of the style were already emerging and they described Rembrandt effects pictures as unusual and extravagant. Others claimed that the technique had so completely saturated the market that all portraits were beginning to look the same. But these criticisms of sameness or of a photographic trend sweeping the visual landscape predate social media by 140 years. So to contemporary critics of social media who complain that Instagram is ruining photography, I always respond with the Rembrandt effect. Photography has always been trendy and critics have always decried that trendiness. This Instagram account, uh, Insta Repeat, reveals the remarkable similarity of pictures on Instagram. The account gathers pictures from many other accounts and collages them together in one grid. So these 12 pictures were made by different photographers, but everything from the subject to the composition, the lighting and color makes them nearly identical. Here's another set from Insta Repeat feet over the edge, a horse true bend, 12 different photographers doing exactly the same thing. 
And then finally, this is a fairly old trend in the world of social media, the hashtag follow me too. But notice the comments especially. People love to hate on trends. Bad Dog Matt says, I hate this one more than any other. And 10 My Love says, this shot drives me nuts and I would unfollow anyone who did it. Critics in the 19th century actually felt the same way about their trends. Once it was popular, once everyone was doing it, it was over. But Rembrandt effect lighting is still used today, although it's much less pervasive. And uh, this is a photograph by the excellent photographer Dana Scruggs. Rembrandt effect is often used in fashion and editorial photography, as in this image by Eric Carter. But I'm noticing a fast shift that's been taking place since the beginning of the pandemic and the rise of Zoom. Online tutorials or how to look good on Zoom all recommend a single bright frontal light to avoid the side lighting of Rembrandt effect. Why? Because shadows and side lighting on Zoom tend to emphasize wrinkles and skin imperfections and puffy eyes and all those things that the pandemic has increased tenfold in everyone. But Zoom is changing another aspect of photography too. And this trend was more recent than the Rembrandt effect and I'll call these high angle selfies. With all the attention paid to selfies in the early 2010s, it comes as no surprise that advice proliferated online for how to take a good selfie. One of the rules that always made these listicles was the avoidance of the low angle view or the quote, up the nose view as Kim Kardashian called it. Kim patiently explained her selfie practice for Cosmo. She said, always take your selfie from above, angling down. I think there's nothing worse than someone who wants to take a selfie and they take it from the angle down below, you know, and they get some double chin action. In 2010, OkCupid ranked more than 7,000 user photos according to Pose and number of messages they received from potential dates. And overwhelmingly, the pictures that received the most attention were photographed from high angles. Okay, Cupid even removed cleavage bearing shots from the sample and still found that users who posted high angle selfies received 50% more new monthly contacts than those who posted the second most popular pose, pictures taken in bed. But as recently as the 1940s, low angle shots were considered preferable. At the time, just after color film became widely available, instructional literature bemoaned American photographers' ineptitude with the new technology. One of their chief offenses were distracting colors. So photographers suddenly had to learn to see the world in terms of hue and color contrast rather than just tonal values. Where light and shadow easily created separation between objects in black and white photography, Contrasting colors had the tendency to stick out of an otherwise subdued background. They collapsed the appearance of depth and overwhelmed the subject. This had the greatest impact on portrait photography, where it was necessary to separate the subject distinctly from the background. Contrasting colors came to prominence, regardless of their relative sharpness or brightness, and instead of receding into the background, as had been widely recommended for black and white portraits, they came forward. Red flowers in a green bush is a classic example of one of these distracting backgrounds. So the solution to the problem of distracting backgrounds for Kodachrome users was simple, according to these guidebooks in the late 1930s and 40s. Just shoot everything and everyone against the sky. One how-to author explained, quote, the sky is about the finest of all backgrounds because it is unobtrusive and infinitely varied and because it usually forces you to use a fairly low camera angle, an angle that gives your subjects a psychological advantage, thereby giving you a better picture. The dogma of the most flattering angle is really just a trend, and it changes with the decades. When I worked as a wedding photographer right out of college and in Santa Barbara, I was taught to avoid low angles for portraits at all costs. We even carried step stools with us to get the perfect high angle shots. Despite the instructional literature's insistence that one angle is the best or most flattering, both high angle and low angle portraits turn out to be a matter of taste and preference. As soon as I started research for this book, most of the supposedly unassailable rules in photography have undergone similar reversals. I'll conclude with another apparently ironclad rule that I learned at Brooks and which I took to be a given. 
people look best at golden hour, the hour immediately following sunrise and preceding sunset. I was shocked to discover in the course of my research that for most of the 20th century, golden hour didn't exist. And that's not because the sun wasn't rising and falling, but instead, amateur photographers were advised to avoid the warm, low angle light associated with sunset and sunrise. Only when this dramatic quality of light became recognized as a desirable aesthetic in the mid 1990s did the phrase golden hour start appearing in the how to literature. Exposure guidelines were included in every box of Kodachrome since its debut in 1936. However, these printed charts only guaranteed accuracy for pictures taken more than one hour after sunset or after sunrise and more than one hour before sunset. Some guidebooks allowed that this warm color could be a positive feature when representing landscapes, but they also cautioned that it was totally unsuitable for portraits. One author explained, just before sunset, the color of the light is markedly red. It's only natural that pictures made at that time sometimes appear abnormally colored. Avoid this difficulty by making your pictures of people earlier than two hours before sunset. While it was easy in the early years of Kodachrome to blame the difficulty on film's tendency to exaggerate saturated colors, the problem wasn't a wholly technical one, as a few books recognized. The how-to author Fred Bond wrote of photographing during the forbidden hours, quote, if flesh tones appear badly sunburned, do not blame Kodachrome, it recorded what it saw. Until the early 1990s, instructional guides recommended the use of corrective filters to simulate normal daylight color balance for portraits taken during sunset and extreme lighting condition. But in the 90s, however, fashion and advertising photographers began intentionally applying this golden glow to their street scenes and other outdoor photo shoots. They also began simulating golden hour with warming filters in the studio. And then by the mid 90s, the photographic literature also started to reflect this major shift in practice. Quite suddenly, the photographer's working times were inverted. Now the midday hours from 10 until 4 were useless. And as popular photography advised in 1997, the quality of light during the last hour before sunset is better than the rest of the day put together. Avoid it at your peril. The phrase golden hour appeared regularly in all manner of periodicals from local newspaper articles on how to take the best summer snapshots to the advice columns of specialist photography publications. The application of the moniker golden hour did not occur until the effect was celebrated, giving it the aura of a closely guarded trade secret. So as these reversals show, there is no universally good picture, only those that appeal to their viewers at a given cultural moment. And the trends become obvious when you look through many editions of these Kodak guidebooks, which at one point tell you to never photograph people at sunset, and then a few years later, they tell you to always photograph people at sunset. So to show you some more of these rules and changing trends in action, I'm now going to turn to your good pictures. There were some fantastic photos submitted, and in addition to the visual trends they highlighted, there are also many wonderful stories. So I'll tell you about the trends in these few groups of photos and then ask each person to unmute themselves and say a couple things about their picture. Maybe you'll tell us who's in it or when it was taken or why you like it, but we have to keep each of these stories short. So think about a couple sentences or 30 seconds and I'll have to cut you off otherwise. So we'll turn first. Uh, I'm gonna bring up the chat just in case anybody has anything to say here. We're gonna turn first to square format photos. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the square, and then we'll come back to these pictures that were submitted by members of the audience. So the history of the square format was a fascinating discovery for me in my research. Instagram's use of the square and color filters in the 2010s made the format seem nostalgic, just for Insta Instamatic or Polaroid pictures of the 1970s. But the square actually has a much longer history. First, I should point out the obvious, that circular lenses produce circular images. But mid 19th century photographers straightened those edges out into rectangles by masking them. 
and they wanted to mimic the conventional shape of paintings. When George Eastman introduced his first camera, the Kodak number one, he promised to do the processing and developing, and it was easier and cheaper for the Eastman company to simply crop these things, uh, or not crop these things down, but to send back round pictures as they appeared. So these are some um, early Kodak snapshots um, in the original circular shape. But eventually Kodak moved to a two and a quarter inch square size for film um, in their next generation of amateur cameras, the Brownies that were first released in 1901. This square format um, used an adapter to transform the square of the film into a more conventional rectangle. And that same film format, the two and a quarter, was adopted by the Roliflex, which hit the market in 1929. Like the Brownie, this camera produced square negatives, but the Roly's controls and optics were much more sophisticated than the Kodak Amateur line, and the camera quickly became a favorite among professional photographers. In recommending the Roly, one author wrote that picture shapes are, of course, a matter of taste, but with the Roly, you shoot first and decide afterwards on the shape. It is easy enough to trim off part of the print or enlarge only part of the negative for horizontal or vertical formats, or you just leave it as it is. But it need cause no worry when taking pictures. And this tells me that even Rolly didn't really intend for their pictures to end up as squares. Square compositions had long been off limits for artists because it was considered a dull and tensionless shape. And the camera companies really followed these prescriptions, offering cameras with inserts and masks to make rectangles out of circular lenses on square film. But professional photographers who were accustomed to composing their images in camera rather than cropping later, including these two Life magazine photographers, Dorothy Line and Gordon Parks, they began composing in the square format, like you see in these two images. And you can't easily crop either one of these images down to either a horizontal or a vertical composition because you'll lose part of the central subject. And this was a source of frustration for editors of Life and other magazines because their magazines best accommodated rectangles because it mimicked the shape of the pages. The square in the 40s was mostly um, a professional's choice but it was revitalized in the early 1970s when Polaroid released the square shooter camera. Square format film was advertised by Polaroid as a cost saving option because it was a little bit smaller. They say, quote, you can save 25% with this film just because our new square pictures are a little smaller than our regular ones. So when we see square pictures like these, they carry all that history, all the way back to the beginning of amateur photography and the Kodak camera in the 1890s. So now I'm going to invite um, Odette to unmute herself if she'd like and say just a couple things about this picture. Who's in it? When was it taken? Um, and remember, I might have to cut you off. All right, <laughs> tell me Odette. Thank you so much. So this is actually a photograph of me. It was taken by my mum in the late 1970s. I'm wearing hand-me-down clothes. This is at my parents' farm and I'm standing on an old tank stand wearing my dad's rain boots. I so wanted to be him and I have his haircut which my mum also gave me sitting outside on a chair on that tank stand. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this picture and that history. It's definitely a snapshot you made in the moment, even if Odette maybe wore these boots quite a lot. <laughs> uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dane. Can you tell us a little bit about this fantastic image? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, great. Hi, this was taken around 1980 in New York City at a place called Fiorucci's, which was one of the early uh, hip, cheap, cheap uh, fashion stores. <clears throat> and I had read that there was going to be a signing of Andy Warhol, uh, his magazine, by Truman Capote. And I, and I wasn't sure about Warhol, but anyway, I went up there because I was a fan of Truman Capote. And they ended up standing next to Capote and Warhol for about three hours. So I took a number of pictures of both of those guys, and they all signed their things. And, uh, and signed a magazine to me 
So uh, I'm a fan of the square format because I think when you get it right, it's really powerful. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that story and for this picture. Um, and we know, of course, that Andy Warhol would have admired this kind of picture taking on the fly too. Um, and now I'll see if Cassandra's here. Cassandra, can you say a little bit about this image? We can't hear you. Ah, maybe? Okay, then I will move on um, and just say that this is also a Polaroid. Uh, it's marked Christmas 1979. It's one of those wonderful images um, that definitely speaks to us of a, of a snapshot recording an important moment. Oh, I've got a question in the Q&A. Maybe she'll say it there. Oh, looking for the unmute uh, button. Don't worry, Cassandra, there's another picture of yours coming up. So um, we'll see that soon, I think. Um, let's see, and I'm moving on now. To, next two trends are related. I'm going to start with these outdoor group shots, which will lead into flash photos. Um, so you know you're on deck, you three. So another surprise discovery for me was that in the 19th century, photographers talked about having a season for photographing. Um, and as I said earlier, photography required a huge amount of light, especially for portraits, because people had a tendency to move, which you can see in this cartoon from the 1860s. So captions um, in the cartoon are describing that this man, who in the first image on the top left, you can't see um, because the photographer didn't hit him at all. Um, and then next he gets his hat. And then you see in the third, um, that the guy's moving a little bit. And then down here, he picks up on a pretty girl across the way, it says, and he starts nodding at her. So you get all this motion blur because we're inside and it requires so much light to make that image. Um, so getting your portrait made in the 19th century was a real challenge sometimes because of the amount of light required um, and also because you had to stand still. So it may last 30 seconds or more um, during which you have to wait for this picture to be made. And they, there were some devices invented um, to make this posing process a little bit easier. Um, you could have used one of these posing machines. It's a cast iron device um, meant to help the sitter stay still. So it would clamp behind your neck and maybe hold your arms in a slightly unnatural pose um, and provide you something that you could rest against. And in this picture um, from the Library of Congress, you can actually see the leg of the posing machine uh, between the man's legs. And that's not uncommon in these portraits. So by the time that amateur cameras like the Kodak came along in the early 20th century, it's gotten a lot easier to make portraits in studios, but most homes are still too dark to photograph in. So many people took their group pictures outside. So we have tons of examples of folks standing in front of their dark green hedges or bright white walls, and they actually far outnumber amateur pictures made of people inside, even as late as the 1960s. So now I'm going to go through these and ask um, Ro, are you here? And could you tell us about this picture? Yes, hi. Um, this is a picture of myself and my first cousins in England in about 1957 um, in our garden on this quite rickety slide that I'm sure someone in the neighborhood in the neighborhood made. And there I am, number three down, and it rage, ranging in the age group. And I think it was just a, a good way to get us all together, keep still, and look at the camera. <laughs> Great, yes, those are all big challenges of photography. I mean, even still today, right? It's hard to photograph a large group, um, but a wonderful background and nice setup here. Um, so let's turn to Donna. Donna, are you here? Would you like to introduce mm -hmm. your photograph? Don't leave me to uh, that is probably Easter Sunday. It's my brother and I with our dog Rex. Uh, we lived on their farm, like in the background, peony ready to bloom. Beautiful. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing this image. Um, and I know that Norris is not here, um, but this uh, photograph, another outdoor family portrait, definitely made because it's too dark uh, to photograph inside. And so now we'll turn to the solution to this problem, which is flash. Um, specifically on camera flash, which became available to the amateur market in the 1950s. So here again are the photos and I'm going to walk you through a brief history of flash photography first. So the earliest, most widely used artificial light for photography used magnesium wire, which produced a bright white flame that lasted for almost a minute. But again, it was a flame and it was unguarded. Uh, it was used in 1865 for these pictures inside an Egyptian pyramid and for pictures inside the catacombs in Paris, also in the 1860s. And these were both places that people thought it would be impossible to ever create photographs. Magnesium flash powder uh, replaced that finicky magnesium wire in the 1880s, but the flash powder was probably even more dangerous. So Jacob Reese, uh, the early documentary photographer of New York tenements, was said to have lit several apartments on fire with his magnesium flash powder. And here again, you can see that dark shadow behind the woman's head and you see how everything is um, illuminated, especially close to where the photographer was standing. So that wash tub um, and the floor, but you have some really deep shadows behind. So this is a very directional light as is um, the electronic flash that finally became accessible to amateurs in the 1950s. So flash cubes and flash bulbs were available for popular photography uh, after World War II, but they were usually connected to the body of the camera and they tended to cast those really large dark shadows wherever they were pointed. So you get uh, the person standing in the front of the photo and a giant um, shadow behind them. And one photo magazine even described it as a ghost that needed to be exercised from the image. So advanced amateurs at this time, and many guidebooks taught this technique, used a flash cord and either bounced the flashlight off a white ceiling or a nearby wall or reflector. So they took the flash off the camera or used a separate flash so that they could get a more evenly distributed light. And you could photograph people in dark spaces without those looming dark shadows, no exorcism required. But pictures that use on-camera flash, they bear a strong association still with amateur snapshots. So although like many other former failures, this too has become a deliberate aesthetic. Fashion and celebrity photographers like Jürgen Teller used on-camera flash to signal a kind of authenticity and access, as if these pictures were made casually like a snapshot, maybe almost like Dane's picture with the Polaroid. Um, and Teller made this technique popular or the revitalization of this technique popular in his ad campaign, campaign for Celine in 2011. So now I'm gonna go back to these flash photos um, and I hope that Cassandra is able to unmute herself. Let's see, can you tell us about your picture? Oh man, it looks like you're unmuted. And I've got a question in the Q&A. No luck, she says. Sorry, everybody. Um, I can tell you that this is a wonderful, not only a square format photo, uh, but a, a hard flash. You've got that shadow uh, in the background. And um, of course it kind of compresses the space a little bit, almost like um, a cutout in front of the background. And let's turn now to Marie. Marie, could you unmute yourself and tell us about your picture? Are you there? Am I? We are. Yeah. Okay. This was a Polaroid picture taken about 1970 and I'm on the left and my buddy Val is on the, um, the other side, I guess, depending on your orientation. I'm on the right of the picture. Um, I claim that this may be the first selfie stick <laughs> because we were camping and we rigged up a way to take a picture of ourselves and we found like a piece of firewood or something there that I'm holding. And we're kind of, that's the picnic bench, we're on the ground. Um, 
And of course, Val is flashing a peace sign, which was typical of the 70s. Um, and you have it under flash. I, I, I totally forgot about the fact that we must have had a flash. I think you must have, and I can see it kind of in your eyes um, and the, some of the shadows behind you, but you're right. This is a picture that um, is evidence of so many trends. It's just a wonderful one. So thank <laughs> you for sharing it with us, Marie. Sure. Um, let's turn now, uh, is Johanna here? Right. This picture I know came from Paris so, um, and she said it was 3 a.m. at the time of this talk. So she may or may not make it. It sounds like um, she's not made it. Here we go. Another flash picture indoors. Um, some shadowy people. Um, Rich, are you here? Can you tell us about your uh, photo? You have the wrong Rich. It's not me. No Rich here? Anybody recognize this photo? <laughs> Okay, um, it's a fantastic example of the square format, a flash. Um, we would definitely hi. identify it as a snapshot. Do I hear somebody? Yeah, hi, this is Rich. Hey, tell us about hi, it. So, that, uh, so it's probably 1969. That's my wife in the foreground and her uh, then little sister, probably not too long after she was born in July. So it's probably late 1969 and uh, Dad was definitely a avid amateur photographer and, and still is. As awesome. am I. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for sharing the photo and for the story. Um, and we might turn back to Odette again. Can you tell us about this picture? I sure can. So thank you, Kim. This picture is of me. Again, I'm sitting on a watermelon. This was the first worthy watermelon of the season of 1976. My dad took the photograph. He also would have picked the watermelon. And it's not really a snapshot of me at all. It's I'm there for scale to show how big this watermelon is. And I'm sitting on our kitchen floor. I've had a bath and I'm wearing a little cami top before going to bed. And it actually has little chevrons of watermelon wedges on, on the shirt. That's great. Thank you for all the detail. And I'm noticing too, just how hard it is sometimes to place an image um, that's a different color scale than others. So I wouldn't have guessed um, that this um, black and white uh, Instamatic photo um, was you. There it is. <laughs> um, thanks everybody. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those pictures. As you can see, there's no one type of good picture. Um, no matter what the rule books say, these rules change. And sometimes we even change the rules ourselves. The scenes and the people that make good pictures also de change depending on who's taking the photo. So when looking through family snapshots, at the pictures that you admire, um, most of them are almost certainly your good pictures. And so I'm going to end this with that thought that you each have your own history of photography, maybe in albums or on your phone or in the cloud, and those are your good pictures. So thanks everyone. And I will um, open it up now to questions, which I think you can pose in the Q&A box. So Todd is asking uh, about trends whose rise is associated with the film to digital transition. Yeah, this is such a great question. Um, there were definitely trends that uh, responded to the increase uh, or the rise of digital photography and most of them went back to analog. So some of the trends that I can think of uh, from the 2010s, the late um, 2000s, 
um, cross-processing, which is definitely a chemical analog trend. Um, I think that was evidence of people wanting to see chemicals again and not just think about photographs as these things that um, are without body. You know, they're just um, images, not objects anymore. Yeah, thank you for that question. Let me see a few more coming in. Maggie, um, what am I working on for my next book? Are there any trends left to explore? First, yes, thank you for this question and this goad. Um, there are so many trends left to explore and I've had a number of people asking why it ended in 2019 um, and if, it, uh, if the trends are the same when you look at other countries. Um, and absolutely, there are other trends um, happening right now um, on Snapchat um, and in other forums. Um, I didn't talk much about stickers um, or emojis, but there are lots of ways to animate photos um, and to interact with them in a more um, augmented reality uh, situation. And so I would definitely be interested in that. For a next book, um, I am thinking more about literary biography um, and I'm interested in telling histories of photographers who haven't had the mainstream press um, that um, many of our, you know, canonical photographers have. So in the way that I'm interested in snapshots, which are kind of a disregarded art form, I'm also interested in photographers who haven't gotten the same um, level of uh, attention that they deserve. So thank you, Maggie, I'll tell you more. <laughs> um, Ann Mersman asks, which trends do I love to see on Instagram and which do I hate? Um, I, you know, recently I've just had a, um, I've had a, a communal moment uh, with Instagram when on September 9th, uh, the skies in San Francisco Bay Area where I'm based turned um, sickly orange because of the fires, like as far away as Oregon. So I'm sure many of you also saw this, if not on Instagram, then on the news. And so it was a fascinating experience uh, to see the same picture that I had just taken out my window appear on Instagram from all of my friends around the Bay Area. So it was comforting to feel like we we're part of a community. Um, but the hashtags that ended up being associated with that were no filter. <laughs> and I find that um, really comical that because it was also impossible to take that picture without changing it in some way. Um, our phone cameras um, software is not adept at recognizing this kind of sickly orange light. It's not golden hour, it's something else. And so the cameras were automatically adjusting and improving this color. So I know when people tag those no filter that it couldn't have been true. <laughs> so that was the one that I, um, I had a, a, the most passionate reaction to recently. Thank you, Anne. Um, and Sandra asks, how has the smartphone changed the dynamics of photography today and what is considered a good photo? Well, definitely the smartphone enables more people's photos to be shared more widely. There are ways of sharing photos before. They were slideshows, they were family albums, they were books and magazines. And so it's true that you can have your photos seen more widely. Um, you take more pictures today. Um, but I don't think in terms of trends that things have changed that much. I know that there were trends in the 19th century. I know that they changed pretty quickly as do all of you after seeing the Rembrandt effect um, get disparaged after only two years of being in use. So I am definitely aware of the parallels in history. Um, but one of the other things that I've noticed that's strange about smartphone photography, even looking through my own camera roll, is that I, I take a lot of pictures that people wouldn't consider pictures. You'd consider them Xeroxes. Um, I take pictures of receipts. I take pictures of um, books. I take pictures of my car license plate so I don't lose it in the parking lot if it's a rental. Um, all this stuff that we wouldn't really consider even a snapshot. And so I'm really curious about how we would categorize that. And maybe to speak to Maggie's question, that might be an area of research too. So thank you, Sandra. And I'm hearing from Cassandra Jones now, an emerging trend or the next big trend. Well, I think the next big trend, and it's not here yet, but I think it's gonna be augmented reality. I think um, interacting with things, um, which is something that we can do on Google AR and lots of other AR platforms, 
um, is possible and it's popular, but especially as we are socially distant, I think that there's an interest in having like people in our space who aren't here. Um, and so what might it be if, um, you know, if this is not necessarily a hologram situation, but what's it look like to see ourselves in other places? I mean, we can already do that a little bit, right? I'm sitting in your fill in the blank, living room, dining room. I don't know where my image might be, but it's somewhere in your house. Um, I think that's, that's probably going to be the future is augmented reality. Wow, I feel enormous time pressure with all these questions. I think I can do it. Dane Goodman asks, um, how many good pictures do you have in your collection? Um, and how long have I been acquiring them? That is also a wonderful question. Um, good pictures. I have a tendency not to identify my own pictures as good pictures, um, I have to admit. Um, but I do have a miniature collection of picnic snapshots. I love people to see people transferring their indoor life outdoors and all the ways like the material and equipment that that takes. Um, and so I love looking at these snapshots that are mostly late 19th century, early 20th um, and seeing how some of these um, familiar domestic things can transform the outdoor space. So um, that's also a good recommendation or a reminder, Dane, that I should maybe think about my own um, recommendations and look for some good pictures in my own collection too. Um, Julie Joyce says, oh, the, this is, I love this question. What gave you the idea of this book and the particular approach, um, which is not a typical academic approach? Um, yeah, that is a, a wonderful question. And I think the book grew out of two earlier research projects. The first one was on motion blur. Uh, so as I showed you in the portrait section, it's really difficult to take a portrait in the 19th century without blur. And so blur was a really bad thing for photography in the 19th century. But in the 1960s and 50s, I started seeing in the magazines a lot of pictures of blur. So mostly motion of um, race horses and sports cars and you know people running or playing tennis. And I started thinking about what made those pictures okay. Like how did we finally turn over the prohibition against blur? And so noticing that first turnover was um, interesting to me. And then I noticed a second one, which was um, the low angle of portrait. And so after I put together these two things, I started thinking there must be lots of these trends that get changed. Um, so you have a rule and then it's overturned, sometimes like very quickly. If a new technology is introduced, uh, almost like Todd's question, we have digital photography and suddenly people wanna go back to analog. I think the same thing is sort of happening in some of these other trends. Um, so it was noticing those two trends that really um, inspired the book. And then why uh, the 50 chapter format? I think it's because this is the kind of book that I prefer to read. Um, I like short chapters um, and I wanna be able to teach things like this. Uh, so my interest was really making a book that is accessible because everybody takes pictures and this is not just an academic topic. So that's a great question, thank you. And Erica says um, <laughs> that we have similar backgrounds. So she really appreciated the talk and hopes to meet in person, agreed. I realize that I'm supposed to be reading these Q&A questions out for you, so I hope you all are able to follow along. Um, Donna asks, uh, this is a great question too, when posting old or really old photos to the cloud for storage, is it kosher to crop? That is an interesting question. So as a historian, I would prefer that they're not cropped because the borders are interesting to me. And um, if you think back to the picture of Odette sitting on the watermelon, it wasn't perfectly centered in the frame. Um, and I'm curious about that. You know, it tells me a little bit about either the moment when her dad was making the photo or the kind of camera that he used. So to make those pictures most valuable to history, I would not crop them, but you can always save them in a separate folder um, cropped um, for slideshows or albums. That's a great question. And Dimitri asks, um, trends arising from computational photography. 
are there trends arising from computational photography? So I will do my best to describe um, computational photography. But as I understand it, um, smartphone cameras like the iPhone 11 or the Pixel 4 are, doing, uh, are taking multiple exposures and averaging them together. This is very simple, or simply described. But they're allowing people to take photos at night that never could have been taken before. Um, they're doing things like adding a blurred background, which was formerly the province only of a lens based effect. Um, so I think related to the pictures of the orange sky, I think the failure of the smartphone um, in that case was actually a failure of computational photography. Because when people um, create the software for um, computational photography, they're looking at typical lighting scenarios like daylight, open shade, um, you know, maybe a sunset. But this color of light was something that these cameras really haven't seen before. And the cameras tended to correct it to make it more, look more like a normal sky. So it's super dark outside. It's trying to lighten it up. Um, or it's orange, it's trying to make it more yellow or blue. So um, I think computational photography, um, it has an idea of what it wants to see, or, you know, like all software, um, it's described by people who make it. And so I'm curious about the future of computational photography, if we might have to integrate more of these kinds of climate catastrophes um, into their code. I hope that um, can touch on your answer. Um, and Vicky asks, do you worry about where all the phone photographs will be in 50 years? Will current snapshots survive? Um, I think that's a really important question. Um, yeah, I do worry. I have all everything on my computer backed up in three places, um, two places in the cloud and one physical location. So yeah, I do worry about that. Um, but also because I have everything backed up in three places, I also worry about how many photographs there are going to be for historians to study in the future. Um, so it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, what are we going to do with all these pictures of receipts and, you know, pictures of menus and wine bottles and um, car license plates? So it's, um, it will be an interesting time for sure. And Cassandra asks, do you think the pandemic has had any particular effect on photo photography trends? And I think, yeah, it really has. I am especially interested in how our spending so much time on Zoom is going to impact what we think looks like a good photo. So because um, Zoom lighting is so different, we want different things from uh, a video uh, image of ourselves. Um, will that affect um, static photos or still photos? Yeah, I think it really will. Um, other photo trends, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was seeing a lot of uh, window reflection portraits. So for as long as I know, um, it was considered a faux pas to get a reflection um, in a glass surface in your photo. But at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were very uncertain about um, what the coronavirus means and how it could be transmitted, there were lots and lots of portraits made um, at places like hospitals, but also just regular portraits made with the visible window reflection in them. And I think that was meant to signal the distance, you know, a safe, appropriate social distance between the photographer and the subject. Um, but it was also supposed to say this is about the pandemic. You, it's um, making the coronavirus visible in the photograph in a way that we couldn't in other ways and otherwise. So yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And Gorman asks, can you speak about platinum prints um, in the 1920s and 30s and also how they differ from gelatin silver as a choice? Yeah, um, this is an interesting question. I think also trend related. Um, so platinum prints have a very uh, subtle tonality. Um, they don't have the same kind of high contrast as a gelatin silver. Um, and as I understand, um, both were subject to rationing um, following World War I. So um, these metals, these precious metals, um, were not being used for photography. And so I believe um, that platinum started to replace gelatin silver when amateurs couldn't get a hold of gelatin silver products. Um, but yes, they have a very different aesthetic um, and they're meant to be 
I think their subjects are often much softer um, and because they don't have that hard contrast of gelatin silver. Uh, cool. Um, I think, let's see, I can maybe get through a couple of these. Um, I've got a question from Richard. Um, there used to be a New York Times above the fold image that was the seminal image that defined the day, the week, the month. Yeah, he's right. And he says, now we have videos, like a video of George Floyd. Are there apparent evolutions? Um, is there a power of still versus video or vice versa? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, yes, I, you know, I still get a print New York Times on the weekend and uh, it's always sort of a disappointment because I already know what the stories are gonna be because I saw them on my phone the night before. Um, but I do think that that singular image um, still makes an impact. It's almost like, um, the great theorist um, critic of photography, Susan Sontag, says that um, photographs are memorable because they contain a neat slice of time, whereas she calls a video a set of under-selected images. So I do think that photographs, still photographs, are still important because they are so memorable. You can see one image and hold it in your mind perhaps more than a whole um, uh, you know, a, a big long um, set of images in a moving picture. Um, and related to that, um, Rich uh, asks about the live photo, which is really interesting too. Um, there's been a move among art photographers to blur the boundaries between still photos and videos, and they're making these very short clips. Um, and I think that the live photo sort of responds to that um, and certainly the live photo feature was probably introduced um, to help correct for things like bad framing or somebody blinking their eyes, but it also, um, it gives to me a, a kind of uncanny um, body to the photograph. Um, it has a life um, beyond that still thing that you could see. Um, so that is fascinating also. So I've got one more question here. Um, I see Kenneth asks, 3D photos were introduced in the early 20th century and the fad has been revived periodically many times afterwards. It's dead at the moment, but will it ever come back? Um, that's a great question. I do love um, stereograph viewers. And um, I, I think that the images that we're seeing more today with um, augmented reality are a form of 3D photograph. We, want it, we can see a thing in our space when we're looking at our screen. But yeah, it seems to have more of a like specialist or a kind of curiosity effect. It's not, um, for some reason, um, kind of like the smell of vision it's really never caught on. Um, so I see that it's six o'clock and I have been tasked with wrapping this up. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, and if Patsy Hicks is here, she may want to say a few words also, but otherwise, thank you. Kim, we also want to thank you. That was fantastic. Um, not only in the review of all the techniques, but what fun to look back at those different eras and to hear people's personal stories. Um, I think now more than ever, we're feeling that hunger to connect and photography helps us do that. And you've really given us a, a wonderful way of doing that tonight. So um, I will look forward to looking through this again. Um, it's the kind of book that you can go back to, which is my favorite kind. So um, such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you to everyone who participated. There were fabulous questions, even more fabulous photographs. And um, I look forward to taking more good pictures and possibly a tutorial on Zoom lighting is in my future. So thanks, Kim. It was great fun. Um, good night to everyone. and. Um, Here's to more good pictures in all our lives and the events to capture. So good night.